So welcome to the International Human Resource Management webinar series. Uh, this is a series organized by Simon Fraser University in Canada um, with Mila Lazarova and Dana Higgins um, from Penn State University Center for International Human Resource Studies, myself, Elaine Farndale, uh, from ESCP Business School in Germany and in France, and that's Marion Festing and Moral Moretbakova. And we also have RIT Croatia with Maya Vidovic, and we have Clarion University in the in, in the US um, with um, uh, Miguel Olivas. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> name was uh, wouldn't come up off, off my tongue. Um, so, um, on behalf of all of the organisers, I'd like to welcome you today. Uh, we have people joining from across the US, across Europe and into uh, Australia and Asia, which is wonderful today. As you'll see, this is being recorded and there will be the opportunity to review the recording afterwards. So uh, the link will be sent to everybody registered for this event. So um, don't worry about needing to ask for slides or anything. You will be receiving the, the recording. Um, a, a, just a little bit of background why we're doing this webinar series. Uh, it's one of the good things that came out of the pandemic. We were supposed to be all going to conferences and studying international HR, um, but of course we weren't able to travel, so we turned to Zoom. But this was in June last year when we decided to do this. And ever since we've had such a great amount of interest in the series, that we've continued it on a monthly basis with a, a little break for our, our summer here. Um, but this is the 11th uh, um, webinar now in the series. So thank you to everybody for your support for this. Um, we, the aim of the, the webinar series is so that we can all keep connected with what's going on in the international HRM field making sure that we can still stay in touch with all the, the latest research and everything that's going on. And today's presentation is very much that, a, um, an opportunity to connect with the current research. So on that note, I would like to introduce to you today's speaker. So Professor Fang Lee Cook from Monash University in Australia. So, um, Fang Lee Cook is a, is a professor at Monash and also a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. Her research interests are in the area of strategic human resource management, diversity and inclusion, employment relations, migrant studies, HRM in the healthcare sector, digitalization and implications for employment in HRM, climate change, energy transition and the future of work, Sustainable Development Goals and the Role of the Multinational Firm. Uh, Fangley Cook's recent research projects examine some of the tensions, challenges and implications associated with these topics for various key stakeholders, such as the state, employers, uh, uh, sorry, employers associations, trade unions, workers and labour NGOs. So building from this very wide range of interests, we're very pleased that Fang will be speaking with us today on the topic of closer, stronger and brighter, bringing IB and IHRM together through the lens of sustainable development goals. So I'm going to hand over to Fang in just one moment. If you have questions or please do have questions, please raise them in the Q&A. Um, the chat feature is not available. Um, and also the raise hand feature, although it's available, we're not using it. Please uh, do put your message, your questions in the Q&A. So on that note, I will hand over to our speaker today and say, welcome, uh, Professor Cook, and please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, thank you very much for your introduction and thanks for the IHIM webinar series for organizer for inviting me. It is a very prestigious opportunity for me. Um, so as Elaine was uh, in, uh, suggesting, my research interest is quite broad. And um, 
So I like to research on different topics and to learn basically. So today, the topic I'm going to present is actually work in progress. Um, that's something that I've been thinking of the last few months or actually more than, more than a year now um, or nearly a year now. Um, I was feeling that um, the IB research and the IHIM research seem to be like separated uh, in a sense. But in fact, there is a lot, of, uh, a lot in common between the two. So what I'm going to go through today is the, um, the sheer interest of IB and IHIM and why do we need to bring them closer and stronger so that it is brighter as well uh, for the field of research and probably making more impact in the, in the world as well. And so I wanted to look at what the IB and IHIM scholars have been calling for. And then I want to zoom in to more specifically on by using an example of how multinational, the role of multinational companies in sustainable development goals, uh, and then what implications it may have for IB research, IB and IHIM research. So um, since everything is in progress, so some of the statements I made may not be so appropriate and or complete. So uh, please bear with me and I most welcome you to give me comments uh, after the presentation or email me to uh, engage in dialogues and conversations and any feedback will be most welcome. I feel that there is a lot of connectivity between IB, IHIM uh, and the multinational uh, studies. And um, although when my when I attend the international conference, in the IB conference, there are IB scholars and IHIM track. But then um, when we talk, sometimes when we have conversation, the IB scholars say, oh, they, you belong to IHIM, or HIM, so it's as if it's not IB, uh, part of IB. And then IHIM and also sometimes don't see themselves as part of IB either. So in fact, there is a lot of overlap. Um, for example, IB research, it look at international trade, FDI management of multinational firms and cross-country comparative studies, for example. And IHRM also look at the global mobility of HR, uh, human capital, strategic and functional HRM, employment relations issues and cross-cultural management and uh, the role of multinational companies, etc. So there is a lot of overlap between. And so it's like, I would call it like an yin and yang, like, as if they are two distinctive field, distinct fields, and the scholars, um, although they don't speak to each other uh, so much, and in fact, there was an article by uh, a few colleagues, um, uh, like Dana, uh, Chris uh, Brewster, and, and Jeff Wood, and others, uh, in JWB um, in earlier this year, um, talking about why a, um, IB and IHRM not talking to each other, and treating it as two distinctive Two distinct field, but in fact, I, I would argue that it's part IHRM is part of IB, um, and there is a lot of interconnectivity uh, between them and interdependence, and also they can complement each other um, and may give rise to each other. And so, therefore, when we join force together more closely, we can become stronger in a sense. Um, if I had a quick look at the kind of cluster map uh, in terms of the research key themes in GIPS, uh, I, I used two leading uh, IB journals here, for example. I know that most of the audience here will be IHRM or HRM audience, so I, I don't use the uh, HRM journal because you'll be quite familiar with it. Um, so if we look at the GIPS, um, the kind of key clusters in the last uh, of uh, research themes in the last 30 years, uh, we generated kind of nine clusters here. Four subject matters are directly related to IHIM. For example, culture, bargaining power, uh, HQ uh, and subsidiary roles and relationship and strategy. All these can uh, will be in, in, will involve in the uh, human resource management side. And if we look at the time zone of G GIPS, so you can see in the middle is performance is the key. And then we also see innovation as a key kind of area for research. So bear in mind that um, I will be critiquing <laughs> of the kind of um, um, predominance uh, of uh, almost like obsession with um, performance, organizational performance 
in uh, management journals, including international business and human resource management journal. And it's quite becoming more and more uh, narrowly focusing on organizational performance. Um, but the wider pictures need to be looked at if we want to really uh, have sustainable organizational performance. If we look at the time, timeline map of chips uh, in the last kind of uh, 30 years, and bear in mind just now I show the clusters. So here the, uh, the, it's the same clusters, uh, the nine clusters there, and you can see the like, culture and the, the timeline where a particular cluster will have a lot more um, kind of research attention than other clusters. I don't have a lot of time for the presentation, so I won't go into the detail. If we look at G, uh, sorry, JWB, uh, then we can see 11 clusters of key research themes and two subject matters directly related to IHRM, culture and talent management. And they, uh, remember talent management here because I'll be critiquing it later. Not critiquing as uh, it per se as a research topic, but I want it to be broadened. If we look at the time zone map of uh, JWB, we can again see that performance, performance management strategy, they are the key theme, the kind of most uh, attractive theme to, to be uh, for study. Um, line, uh, timeline map, again, you can see the, the, uh, the time, um, like talent management is one of the key area and it's a uh, um, more recent time as well. And so, in general, the research on IHRM has been um, having quite a relatively kind of narrow focus within the multinational companies and focusing on formal employees. And my colleague, uh, David Fan, Shirizu and others have, um, uh, they have published a paper recently in JWB, uh, a bibliometric, uh, bibliographic analysis of uh, nearly 2000 articles and they in the, published in the field of IHRM, and they find that three main clusters uh, are below, um, expatriate management, global human capital, and international HRM policies and practices. So these are the kind of key area that has been focusing on. If we, uh, that is related to all journal uh, uh, in the IHRM topic. But if we again zoom into JW uh, GIPS, we can find that, um, the article, sorry, uh, eight clusters related to HRM, and the key focus are organizational performance, citizenship behavior, and language. Language is a relatively more recent interest, research interest in the IHRM field. But you can see from here, again, organizational performance is the key area for research. And citizenship behavior, OCB, um, that reflects the trend of human res uh, in the research, human resource management research. It is becoming more and more micro level and focusing on the organizational behavior and firm performance. If we look at uh, JWB, uh, we generated 13 clusters uh, on the topics related to human resource management. And the key subject matters are like, for example, uh, talent management, culture, uh, intrinsic reward, job satisfaction, knowledge transfer. So these are the kind of key ones. You, you can see that the topics are relatively narrow. Of course, there are other topics being researched too, but you can see that the, these are the key clusters. So I'm calling for uh, bringing IHIM uh, and IB together closer and stronger in the sense that um, both fields have been criticized for the lack of dialogues and collaboration beneficial to extending the knowledge in this field. And both IB and IHIM have expanded into international development areas and sustainable sustainability issues as well. So it is expanding, but not sufficiently. Um, and both fields have, uh, can benefit from ideas, theories, and research angles found in the regional studies and area studies. Area I, here, I mean the subject matter areas such as like employment relations or in, uh, labor, uh, labor market studies, uh, those sort of field. And both fields can also engage in 
with more in-depth empirical studies to understand the, uh, what is going on on the ground as well. Increasingly, as a general editor, I find that uh, in the human resource management field, uh, there is an increasing number of um, papers that are um, quantitative oriented and using cross-sectional uh, survey. And even there, is, there are studies now increasingly using multi-level and multi-time, and that is still not really capturing the story in depth of what is going on on the ground. I'm not saying that quantitative studies are not important, but I'm saying that um, there is still a lot of scope and space for more in-depth empirical studies if we are trying to understand more about sustainability issues, about what are the real issues confronting organizations and the managers, what are they confronting, confronted with, what are their key challenges? Um, not just hypotheses and what may be needed to achieve certain outcome. And what has what our IB and IHRM scholars have been calling for? Um, a general message from the articles I have read uh, in, pers in perspective papers or review papers, opinion pieces, is that um, IB and IHRM or HRM more generally research need to be more relevant to practice and policy. And uh, this research need to be more phenomenon or practice driven. Um, what is confronting the world and business and society? For example, Peter Buckley and colleagues talk about grand challenges. Others talk about mega trends. And Gary L mentioned uh, new realities in the IBR journal this year. And uh, Delios and Doug also mentioned about talk about the policy relevance. And in fact, there is a recent article that came out in the um, Academy, Academy of Management Perspective um, by colleagues, and they were saying that uh, a very small proportion of research in the uh, management field, and particularly in the HOB and HRM field, has policy relevance. Now, the figures, uh, how small the percentage uh, is there, is can be debated, but. In fact, um, increasing number of scholars have now realized that uh, the HRM field and the IB field has have been increasingly detached from the what is happening in the real world, and, and there is and it's also important to look at context like uh, Chris Brewster and Meyer, uh, etc. Uh, colleagues, um, they have all been calling for. Uh, the important role of context in international or in IB and IHR, IHRM research. So why do we pay attention to relevance so much? Um, there are some bigger uh, movement here. Uh, for example, social responsibility. So there has been a strong movement uh, in terms of responsible research in, in, in business and management. And there is also now, the um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, there are 17 goals with 169 targets to be achieved by 2030. This is a very ambitious goal, and research can engage in this area uh, to identify what can be done, what may be the challenges um, in many important ways. Um, so, very briefly, the advance, uh, advancing the kind of IB and IHIM research uh, through the lens of uh, SDG, why is that? Um, SDG address the kind of global challenges we face, including poverty, inequality, climate change, uh, environmental degradation, et cetera, and there are more than this. And the core values of S uh, SDG are fairness, inclusion, and equality. But the achievement of this agenda is, is a very, tough process and is highly challenged by international politics, rivalry uh, of institutions, and also resource constraints. Nevertheless, um, multinational companies, they have to engage with this agenda if they want to kind of make their business sustainable. Because these days, uh, institutional activism is playing a role in, for example, responsible investment. If you not, if your business is in the uh, not in the green energy space, it, it might be difficult to get uh, investment in uh, funding. So there is a big drive 
towards achieving um, SDG or at least uh, climate change um, to mitigate climate change and drive the uh, drive forward a low carbon economy. But leading IB and HI journals have published very few papers on SDG so far. In order to prepare for this presentation, I actually went through all the articles that I could find uh, on the web of science and scopus on with the topic of uh, multinational and um, SDG. And there are fewer than um, 60 articles that are really related to the topic. Most of them are not published in the IB or HIM journals. However, there is an increasing attention now from the IB and HIM field uh, community, uh, like journals and calling for special issues, conference themes, uh, um, engaging in the sustainable development or SDG topics. And engaging in this topic will offer an opportunity for IB and IHRM researchers to address the critiques of, uh, that have been leveled against their field, such as by engaging in uh, the research of big questions and engaging with context and focusing on the long-term human aspect of the function rather than adopting a resource perspective of the function and research and performance-oriented approach to HRM with a short-term priority. So we have seen so far uh, earlier from the uh, screenshots that um, the, um, from the clusters of, uh, you can see that performance was the key uh, topic. Then to do this, um, I would uh, put forward, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> excuse me. I would put forward um, five areas or five, six areas of implications that we may pay attention to. The first is adopting a pluralist and interdisciplinary approach to take into account the interests of various stakeholders. We cannot just adopt a strategic approach and a unitarist approach uh, implicitly, quite often it's in the HRM research. We need to address the interests, the conflicts and diverse interests of various stakeholders and the emergence of the new institutional actors as well, including the formal and informal institutional actors and the uh, competition and uh, resource competition that may arise. Also, we need to include a broader range of institutional actors at various levels in the SDG context that may not be directly related to MNEs, but are nonetheless critical in understanding the role of uh, MNEs in promoting SDG, as well as the impact of SDGs on uh, multinational companies. So we need to look at the two-way effect, basically. And also, we, by adopting a pluralist and multi uh, interdisciplinary approach, we can create opportunities to tap into comparative studies of political systems, economic institutions, and uh, national models um, with implications for MNE strategy, business models, and operations across the countries. So it opens up so much more uh, interesting scope for research. If we look at the um, SDG, uh, the, in, the, in this research, the second uh, implication we may have is to uh, broaden the types of uh, multinational companies and the types of workers in our re research. So the kind of um, preoccupation with organizational performance necessitate uh, researchers to focus mainly on the formal employees and in the kind of formal, within the formal organizational boundary. But in fact, there are new types of organization as multinational companies, for example, international organizations, project-based multinational companies, especially now there are a cluster or a constellation of international organizations and institutions uh, emerging uh, related to uh, the implementation of SDG. So we can look at all those kind of organization and we also need to look at more types of workers. For example, uh, early on, I showed a picture that expatriate management and talent management, these are kind of key areas for research. But if we look, if we look at SDG, then, uh, then we will see that there is a, a line there 
uh, from, we can if, um, move from uh, expatriate, a more elite type of expatriate as global talent to self in initiate expatriate to migrant workers that are um, more ordinary workers to dispatched workers, typically Chinese government or Chinese companies send dispatched workers, uh, they are uh, semi-skilled laborers to construction sites uh, abroad, especially in developing countries for work. And then we also see in African countries and in, indeed in European countries as well, increasingly we see uh, a, a surge of undocumented migrant workers. Um, so they, they may not have formal uh, employment relations with the company. Nonetheless, they are there taking jobs away and that create kind of labor standard issues. And then also the modern slavery issues as well. More recently, IB research uh, or IB community has started to look into the uh, issue of modern slavery. Um, so we can see that um, by looking into or broadening our category of research in terms of the types of workers that may be involved uh, with multinational companies, we can broaden our kind of framework from a very elitist approach to developmentalism approach, that's including the dispatch workers, to a more humanitarian kind of activist, activism approach by linking human capital development and utilization more closely with equality and poverty reduction with policy implications for international bodies as well as national and subnational policy makers and also at the firm level. So there, it is important that we see what kind of workers multinational companies are employing and what kind of multinational companies there are in the world beyond the traditional the big 500 uh, companies. A third implication I want to talk about, uh, a third in implication I want to talk about is the, the need to adopt a bottom-up and inclusive approach instead of an elitist approach. And I mean, all my five uh, kind of suggestions of implications are interrelated. So early on, we talk about the grassroots workers uh, as types of workers that we may examine more closely as part of the MNE research. Then there is the potential role of the grassroots work workforce in contributing to SDGs as well. For example, in frugal innovation can help uh, saving energies and other material consumptions associated with the operation of the business. So that's internally, grassroots, grassroots workers can help the company. They do have talent, they can contribute. Um, but the thing is that talent has been really used as a very elitist way and, and I have long for long been campaigning for the kind of the importance of tacit skills uh, of the workforce, the skilled workforce, and even the ordinary uh, and seemingly unskilled workers. And also these grassroots workforce, they can provide simple and affordable solutions to problems confronting the lives of those in poor communities by using very limited resources because they have been through poor living conditions and challenging uh, environments. So they know how to use their material or resources in a very, very frugal way uh, to make, uh, to better their lives. So they are very valuable to the organization. So we should not kind of uh, dismiss this category of workers. And if we are talking about SDG as being more uh, inclusive and fairness, uh, so then, in the research, we also need to adopt a more inclusive approach to look at the different types of workforce and the role they can play and what we can do for them as well. So there are some misconceptions in innovation. For example, the talk of innovation only applies to high tech companies or at least to the knowledge workers uh, who are well educated and they are the innovative workforce and they are the talents that we need to keep, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, if we look at the sources of creative ideas, most of the innovations are driven by the need to satisfy very basic human needs. But the importance of employees' involvement and user invo involvement is often neglected by firms. And how often do we buy electrical appliances and come back to use it and to find that it's not really very user-friendly. So user involvement is really important and the grassroots employees is also important. But 
at firm level, some quite often they don't have enough HRM practices to incentive incentivize employees to uh, be more creative or, or to to harness their creativity. Um, so we can all talk about research about what kind of leadership that may that may uh, lead to better employee uh, OCB and uh, creativity, but that may lead to better OCB and creativity. OCB is organizational behavior, but um, organizational citizen behavior, but employees may not um, give their ideas still. But if it's relevant to them, they might give the ideas. So I'm just trying to move the screen up a bit. Um, cannot show. Um, so, but people can kind of innovate uh, by using very basic uh, equipment they have. Um, so plenty of innovative ideas on the ground. Um, so we can see when they want entertainment. And, and so, I mean, they can use any material they can find that can be used to make their life a bit easier. So in a fourth implications that I want to talk about is to broaden the subject matter uh, of research. And so for example, the humanitarian role of multinational companies in post-conflict redevelopment and rebuilding, this can be an important role, but we, don't, we haven't really researched so much on the hiring of uh, humanitarian kind of uh, workers or refugees, uh, et cetera, in multinational companies. And it, this can be a significant proportion of workers and it will have um, considerable implications for companies, uh, HRM, in terms of inclusion, et cetera, et cetera. So we can broaden the subject matter as well. And some of the, also some of the most dangerous sectors are operated by multinational companies, such as mining, oil refinery, construction, and even some manufacturing like cement factory, and in war-torn war or politically volatile countries in Africa, Middle East, Southeast Asia. And so all these um, are areas that we can do research on, although getting access to those places to do research is quite a challenge, is another matter. Um, and to understand all these uh, uh, workers, types of workers, and more in-depth uh, understanding of the types of organizations and the types of industry uh, requires the kind of more in-depth qualitative studies from a historical perspective. For example, Peter Buckley in 2021, in his uh, paper in, published in uh, journal of, uh, British Journal of Management, he draw, uh, uh, Peter draws our attention to four aspects of the increasing role of history in international business for example, history as an underpinning for international business theory, history as evidence, history as a source of research practice, um, and also history as a source of research methods. So there is important role about history, about the history of the company, how the multinational company may evolve, may, may have developed from a single small a company with a domestic firm to grow into bigger companies or multinational company uh, for decades, how it has evolved and grow or shrink and, and revitalize itself. So all these issues can be important. But also I want to draw on the, an example about the importance of having, uh, adopting a historical perspective and an in-depth qualitative study to look at a phenomenon that is of international or IB and IHRM relevance. So I think all of you would have heard about the Xinjiang cotton uh, event. Uh, so last year, uh, led by uh, H&M, the multinational giant, uh, retail giant about uh, uh, garment and also other things as well. And they were boycotting uh, the Xinjiang cotton, uh, saying that uh, there was violation of human rights in, in the production of uh, Xinjiang cotton. Um, especially for the ethnic migrant, uh, uh, migrant, uh, not migrant, ethnic minority in Xinjiang area. Now, Xinjiang is a big area, uh, a big production site for cotton. It supply 20% of the world supply and also, uh, but 70% of the 
uh, supply uh, of the har harvest of the cotton is by machine. And if you look at the story uh, in a big more in depth, you find that um, actually, um, so I'm not going to go into the uh, debate about human rights activities or whether there is human rights violation of the ethnic minority of Xinjiang workers in that area. What I'm wanting to draw attention to is that if you look at this Xinjiang cotton production and harvest history in the last 40 years from 1980s to now, you find that big changes have taken place in the 1980s because cotton picking is a very intensive period of work for three months or so from uh, late August to uh, the, before the first frost kick in. And so say November, October time. So in the 1980s, um, the Xinjiang area, they will organize the local workers uh, in factories and in the universities, uh, school children, and also government officials or civil servants to go and help to the harvest. But then later on, uh, when the economic is starting to develop and uh, the government and, org and uh, employment agency were able to uh, mobilize rural migrant workers from nearby or inland provinces uh, to come and do the cotton picking. In those days, it was the young girl, the young women and young men. And some young women actually married uh, young men in Xinjiang after cotton picking. But then since the mid 1990s, China uh, experienced a uh, rural migrant workers uh, shortage. So even in the developed coastal areas in the factory where there is much higher paid wage level and better terms and conditions, um, even those areas could not attract enough uh, young uh, rural migrant workers. So therefore it became the older uh, rural migrant workers going to pick cotton. Uh, like women uh, in their 40s, 50s. But then because the last few years, there has been increasing kind of um, um, automation of cotton picking. So now um, over 70% of the cotton picking is now done by machines. So therefore, even the opportunity for the uh, rural migrant women to do picking, uh, uh, cotton picking job is now diminishing. And in the past, when they came to do co uh, picking, uh, cotton picking for three months, that will be almost one year's uh, un uh, income for the whole family. Um, but even that opportunity has been uh, kind of diminished. So actually, this story unfolds a much deeper and wider scale kind of social economic problems with the strong policy implications for China uh, if China were to continue uh, to reduce poverty and increase in inequality. Sorry, it's my, it was my alarm. But the thing is that um, going back to this uh, global supply chain, if the multinational company boycott Chinese uh, the Xinjiang cotton and shift to other countries well, on ground of human rights violation and shift to other countries to source their cotton product to improve their uh, CSR or SDG achieve, would it have in, improve their CSR achievement and SDG achievement, and if so, who is paying the cost? Because the garment factory, uh, the garment sector or industry, the fashion industry is highly competitive and highly cost sensitive. So, a lot of the costs may be borne by the manufacturers, and so cotton picking is at the bottom of the value chain. So, therefore, it may be squeezed again um, with the kind of terms and conditions. So, there may be kind of unintended impacts of the multinational companies' political actions and non-market strategies in different parts of the world. So it will create, recreate a kind of competition. I'm not saying that the multinational companies should not uh, hold up, uh, should not uh, advance the human rights. I'm saying that they should, but we need to look at the bigger picture, not just a uh, partial picture of it. And also we need to look at the role of the technology in improving labor standards without undermining the employment prospects. So there is actually much bigger play there than just a few campaigns. And so the last point I wanted to say is that there are two points here. Um, uh, taking a more critical lens towards achieving SDGs. And the first point of this point, or first small point of this point is that um, how can the values underpinning the SDGs best serve the interests of the poor people? 
they mind SDGs develop uh, based on ideology, based on United Nations work. Um, the participation of poor country uh, in shaping the SDG uh, have their voice, has their voice been heard sufficiently? So these are debatable. And there have been some critiques about SDG in terms of its value, in terms of its implementability or actionability, and also in terms of uh, how to measure. So um, in our research, we can, we can really test whether these criticisms are accurate and if the criticism are kind of valid, how can it be improved? And also we need to question, can the co-creation and co-configuration of systems such as institutional, technological and ecosystems, can they be achieved between the kind of global North and global South when the Western ideology dominates to gain legitimacy and the actors participate to establish jurisdiction? I have the opportunity to conduct some, uh, some field work or some research projects for international labor organization. Um, I have been to a few poor countries. Um, there have been a big drive for them. If they want to get a uh, dona donation or fund, uh, they need to implement climate change action plans and et cetera, et cetera. So these labor ministers were screaming. They said, we <laughs> Climate change is not a big issue here because we don't have that many factories. But of course, climate change involves more than factory, right? And they don't have that many cars, but they don't have jobs. They need jobs before they can talk about decent jobs. So these ministers were talking, but really screaming. He said, we need jobs before we can talk about decent work. So there is so much you can impose or you can drive the SDG at a high standard if they don't even have any standard or if, if they don't even have enough to eat, um, that is difficult. So what is the role of the multinational companies in this process? Uh, it, uh, it's important to critique. And finally, I wanted to kind of mention that um, when we talk about, uh, we need to adopt a dynamic and inductive view. We talk about the academic thought leadership, um, on the role of multinational companies and SDG, how it may be best developed through the, an inductive lens without presumptions. For, for example, uh, anti-corruption is one of the SDGs uh, kind of target. And in the research of uh, multinational companies and corruption, there has been a kind of predominant assumption that uh, corruption is endemic in less developed countries and has negative impact on Western companies. And then it follows the logic is that how can a Western-based uh, multinational companies mitigate corruption in developing countries? However, Western multinationals, they have been found guilty of engaging in corrupt behavior. And the definition of corruption varies across institutional and societal contexts as well. And also the cause of corruption or anti-corruption may be disproportionately borne by less developed countries rather than by the Western multinational companies themselves because they have more bargaining power. Yeah. So we may need to ask the question differently. Are multinational companies victims or passive participants or even active participants in corruption activities? So there are a lot of things that we can talk about, uh, but to conclude, as an aspiration, the United Nations SDGs project a visionary paradigm of people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership. In reality, when we conduct research in the IB or IHIM area, we may need to frame the research uh, in terms of six Ps like politics, policy, production, practices, and people, and poverty reduction. And the SDG agenda is not only a social and economic agenda, but also a political agenda. And so therefore political economy plays an important role in our research and understanding of the issues. Um, and multinational companies is a powerful actor as well, and it, it, a political uh, actor as well. So research should seek to strike a balance between a strategic vision and aspiration on the one hand, and also embraced a sense of critical realism with local relevance on the other. Um, 
I have benefited a lot, uh, gained a lot from doing field work in, uh, in some of the developing countries to see what issues that they're confronting with, um, how they can, how the Western ideologies can be embedded or introduced to these uh, communities and nations. Um, so that's why I wanted uh, to uh, advocate for a on the ground approach um, to look at on the ground what is really happening before we conceptualize um, and provide suggestions to business. Thank you. And thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Professor Cook. That there is plenty of food for thought there. Um, very stimulating. And uh, I mean, this is the field that I am working in all the time. And you've given me a, a lot of good ideas, of, you know, or ideas, but challenging ideas on how to move forward. We have a number of questions for you. Um, that I'd, I'd like to address in the remaining time that we have. So um, and some of them you, you kind of touched on a little in your concluding remarks. Um, but I will go back to the, the first question that was raised here, first of all. Uh, this was about grassroots employees. So this is going back to the idea that we should be broadening the, the types of, of workers that we're including in our research. And um, the question says, beyond incentives, companies may not even listen to their in-house bottom line experts for improvements and new ideas. How can we change this? Yeah, it, it, that's a very good question. <laughs> we can easily talk of what should be done, but how we do it is uh, really difficult. Um, so I think what we can do is like, maybe through education and through MBA teaching and through uh, executive development courses, we start to kind of at least promote these kind of ideas and write more case studies to show, gather more evidence in our role as the researchers to show companies and businesses what can be achieved. Um, that's one way. Yeah, it's a really difficult question, but it's, it's a good one to get us all thinking about the next, next thing yes. that we can focus on. Yeah, um, so, yeah, so. Sorry. yeah, so I mean, what I'm saying is that when we do research, we don't just focus on surveying knowledge workers and in terms of what kind of leadership style they want in order for them to be more creative. We go into the companies and we go into the field to see what kind of creative ideas have come up with. Because some grassroots workers, they created the ideas, made their job easier, but they don't tell the company because if they tell the company, then the company will squeeze the resources and make them work harder. So there is that element as well. Yeah. yeah good points. Um, the next question is methodological. Um, so this says, I agree that especially formal institutions are key in shaping the management of people in organizations. What would you say are the state of art methods for identifying institutional influence? What are the publishable methodological alternatives to large scale international multi-level studies with 20 plus countries using OECD, ILO, et cetera, indicators to capture institutional country context? Yeah, well, that's again, a very broad and uh, challenging question, yes. First of all, if you are looking at kind of a large data set of OECD countries, uh, then probably most likely it is a kind of quantitative studies. It's very difficult to measure. Um, so, I think if you want to identify informal institutional actors, you really need to go into the field to talk to the people, to talk to the organizations, the managers at the front line. Uh, for example, um, I've been talking to the construction uh, companies uh, in Sri Lanka and in uh, African countries as well. And in Sri Lanka, I actually visited uh, the site and to look at the kind of institutional, uh, to interview the managers there to find out who they have to deal with as key stakeholders or institutional actors. And they, I mean, for example, in Af African context, when they are constructing the roads or mining even, um, tribal leaders play a, actually a very significant role in shaping the HIM practices. For example, the tribal leaders, if you develop a good relationship with them, because the tribal leaders may hold a license for you to operate a mine, right? So even the government has approved you to, to, to go and operate a mine, to do the mining, but it's the tribal leaders may play an important role and can make your life very difficult. 
But if you build a good relationship with the tribal leaders, they might mobilize their, their uh, people in that um, community to go and work with you and manage them for you to some extent. And that actually helps a lot. But then you go to the um, local authority to bargain this and bargain that, or to go out and to try to recruit as a um, outsider um, multinational company with lots of liability, foreignness, liability of foreignness. Yeah, and, and that reminds me of a, a study that um, I, I did a little while ago with R M Maria Beaumont and Sharmin Hartle, where we were looking at how you translate um, HR practices into um, local contexts, but specifically those local contexts were related to mining environments and in, in South America. And it was the, part of the study was just looking at, you know, the, the chains of hierarchy but what emerged from that, because it was a qualitative study, what emerged from it was it was the local people that yeah. had the the you know kind of personal power, not not status power, but their personal power, just by yeah. being community members that were able to facilitate being able to operate there. It, it's not the red tape, it's not the bureaucracy, it's it's at that grassroots level that really makes a difference. So. Yes, yeah. And um, yes, that's right. And I talked to uh, some Chinese managers who have worked in uh, Af Africa uh, in various sectors, in IT, or in construction, in mining. And they all say that um, a lot of the relationship management is very informal, even with the formal institutional actors. It's the informal relationship that matters. And sometimes you can mobilize the informal institutional actors to help you achieve something that you cannot do formally. And yeah, thank you. And, and by this, I don't mean corruption. <laughs> yes, yes. There's, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that point also, I think, in, in these questions a bit. But, um, so uh, the next question then uh, focuses more on the idea of using a, a historical perspective. Um, and the question says, although it is interesting to look at the IBHRM phenomenon from a historical perspective. What about implementation of well-developed policies and SD, SDG initiatives? What is the role of power and politics in the implementation phase of such policies? Yeah, um, that is actually quite political. <laughs> in, implementing the formal policy and practice, uh, I'm not sure I grasp that question very well, but um, my understanding is that how do we implement on the formal SDG policy and practice, right? Yes. Yeah, yes. policy, yeah. Yeah, it, it's uh, really difficult. Uh, implementing any policy is difficult. It basically, it's implementing change. You change the institution, you change the setup, and you change the dynamics and the relationship and everything. So uh, organizational change is always difficult, but institutional change is even more difficult. So it requires the drivers or the actors to really go and negotiate with the local uh, actors to find a win-win solution. Um, maybe not just one particular aspect, maybe uh, related to several aspects. So it's like give and take a more relational approach because SDG, uh, the SDGs, there are 17 SDGs. They are not in isolation of each other. They, the achievement of them or of each one of them may be contingent upon the others. Um, for example, eradication of gender inequality can be achieved through education and through empowerment and all those kind of things. And reduction of poverty will rely on innovation. And that is why innovation is so important. That makes sense. Um, we're, we're running close to time, so I'm just going to move forward. There are a lot of very positive and um, sort of thanks coming through on the uh, the Q and A for your presentation. But I've got one more um, that I'd like to share with you. One last question. Um, it says, based on your insights into the two fields, to what extent is an underlying challenge that most IB and IHRM scholars tend to use different paradigms and come from different disciplinary backgrounds? For example, IB scholars tend to come from economics and perhaps history, while IHRM scholars tend to come from psychology. 
yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that that question really hit the hit the, the well pinpoint of the the main main problem. Uh, because of that paradigm difference, the disciplinary orientation. So therefore, um, it's very difficult to engage in dialogue. And that is why I was saying that we need to broaden our community, research community. We should not exclude each other. We should be more inclusive and seeing IB and IHIM is part. And also we need to open our mind up to other disciplines, uh, other theoretical paradigms. We may not be able to, if I'm, a, I'm not a psychologist, but if I'm a psychologist, I probably will team up with a sociologist to look at some of the sociological matters and the ethnographic methods to look into the kind of qualitative studies. And that has so much more complementary kind of strengths in it. In increasingly, many studies, even though it is very psychological in the HRM field, they look, uh, they mobilize more than one theory, right? Uh, to to look at a uh, for a single study, so I don't see why we cannot mobilize several theories from different paradigms and uh, to to develop uh, to extend the fr uh, frontier basically. So this is about us working together and learning to yeah. just be open to different perspectives and 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 innovate from that. You know, <laughs> take yes. different uh, um, angles. Yes, basically that's what I'm calling for. Um, I'm not, um, what I'm calling for tonight is not by way of criticizing what has been achieved. What has been achieved is good, but we need to move forward. We need to broaden ourselves. We need to be more inclusive in terms of the theories, topics, paradigms, and research targets and subject matters. And I think there's been quite a, a few articles that are, are in the same vein that have been appearing or, or opinion pieces or reviews they're focusing on the, the increased need for plurality, um, more inclusivity, more context-based studies and things in our field. So yes. uh, you know, to me, that what you've presented today is very compelling to keep us moving in, in that direction. Um, but it is time for us to wrap up, I'm afraid. Um, and I'm sorry that we couldn't get through all of the questions here. We will um, share that information with, um, with Professor Cook. Um, at, at the end of this, this recording. Um, we have another webinar coming up. Our next webinar is on October the 26th, and that will be Professor Michael Morley from Limerick University in Ireland. Um, and he will be presenting, if I can find my notes, here we go. <laughs> he will be presenting on how have management and HRM scholars shaped the conversation on the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so please do register to, um, to come along to that webinar. There's a link in the chat right now. And also you can see on the screen, we have our webinar series recordings and you can subscribe to this channel and find out when all new recordings go up there. So please do uh, take that opportunity and connect with us. So thank you very much to our presenter. Um, to all of our co-organizers and to all attendees. And we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. So thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you so much. Goodbye. <laughs>